Death Ships, a 1980 horror film from director Alvin Rakoff. The movie begins on the spooky seas. George Kennedy, Richard Crenna, Nick Mancuso. This is already off to a good start. Just then, a bunch of stuff happens. In German. Hey, look, it's the cameraman. This movie's gonna be mostly boat footage, isn't it? Inside a cruise ship, Captain Ashland is cranky. This is his last cruise before retirement. It's a little weird to see less out of shape George Kennedy. I'm so used to this version. After Ashland retires, Captain Marshall is set to take over the ship. Hey boss, maybe we should use a steady cam for these shots? No, why? That's it, I'm using warp stabilizer. Oh, that's better. Now I can watch the film without needing drama mean. Over in the dining hall. Gah! What's the name of this boat, the Rapture? Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for our band leader, Bert! The gypsy and the guy with the monkey mask sneak off. Meanwhile, the death ship sets a collision course for wackiness. The captain shows up and is immediately disgusted by Jackie. In another part of the ship, Nick and Lori are messing around. No, leave the mask on. They get to the bed and, well... The sailors notice the ship heading towards them. Marshall's kids are getting ready to go to bed. I've never heard this slang before. I gotta go. You just been. Well, I gotta go again. No matter what the seamen do, the death ship changes its course to match them. They call the captain, who's being held up by a passenger. Iceberg, right ahead! They try to turn the boat, but oh snap! Oh dear! Thirteen minutes in, the boat sinks and hundreds are dead. Well, the movie isn't called Life Ship. The next day, the few survivors are floating on some debris. They see Ashland in the water and bring him on board. Hey guys, you might want to turn around. There's a boat sneaking up on you. Uh, guys? They finally notice. The group paddles around until they find a way on board. All aboard the SS Death Ship! Normally, when mentioning a boat, the SS means either sailing ship or steamship. But in this case, it means Schutzstaffel because this is a Nazi ship. Ben runs off and pisses on the ship. This certainly won't annoy the evil spirits on board. Nick and Marshall carry the captain up the stairs. Oh, why do we have to do this? We should have left him in the water. Just then, ah, this is all your fault. They find a ladder and climb up. Ah, the boat's not done with them yet. Spraying raw sewage, really? That's it, I'm renaming you to the jerk ship. Are you kidding me with this? I'm an Oscar winner for Christ's sake. Looks like all the survivors are on board. Nick's searching around and the ship is doing naughty things on its own. It hooks Jackie and drowns him. Oh, change of plans! The ship starts the engines, and Jackie gets pulled into the propellers. Damn you, sentient evil boat! Come on, darling, it's all right. It's all right. Oh, honey, it's all right. You just saw a man die a horrible death. The captain wakes up, and someone's speaking in German to him. Nick gets knocked unconscious. You got knocked the fuck out, man! Inside the boat... I think it happened as long as we're all together. But weren't we all together when the other ship sank, killing hundreds of people? Quiet, dear. Lori searches the boat for dry clothes for everyone. Margaret and the kids find water. Lori finds some clothes, but gets scared off by ghosts! Ashlyn's being haunted by the ghosts of the ship. The doors close, and everyone's locked in. Nick wakes up and manages to open the door. Marshall and Nick make it onto the bridge, where they try to send out a distress signal. They head down to the engine room to find out how the ship's still running. Looking around, they see all the fuel gauges are empty. What ship is this? Is this the ship with the cat inside of a cat or ghost Nazis? Margaret, Lori, and the kids find an old projector. Mrs. Morgan eats some mints, which causes this. Ashlyn is now possessed, so he strangles her. Marshall finds Mrs. Morgan, and Ashlyn tells him they need to bury her at sea. I'm not dead. After that, the ship dumps all the lifeboats, trapping them on board. Lori has to walk around barefoot on all these rusty surfaces? I hope she's up to date on her tetanus shots. Ashlyn finds the captain's uniform and oh no, it's Nazi ghosts! This makes Ashlyn go full on crazy. Nick and Lori find a room where they can lock each other in for the night. We're on a boat overtaken by dead Nazis that have possessed the captain. What should we do? I think we all know the answer to that one. Well, that's over. Let's take a shower. They could have showered this whole time? This song could not be more appropriate. She 
She then flails around in the blood shower for, I'm not kidding, the next four minutes. Nick finds Marshall to try and help save Lori. By the time they get there, she's gone. That's because Ashlyn chucked her overboard. They chase after him, but get trapped into running in slow motion, so he gets away. Ashlyn vanishes into a room. When Nick and Marshall arrive, all that's there is this. They can't not not see what's going on. The two find an infirmary filled with gold teeth and realize this must have been some sort of floating concentration camp. This isn't fun anymore. Nick runs out into the theater where the projector is already on. Look, can you believe it? It's literally Hitler. Nick somehow teleports outside the ship where Ashlyn throws him into the hold. He raises the net, which is full of dead bodies. Ashlyn slams the net, which somehow kills Nick. Marshall finally finds out what the ship runs on. Oh, please say hybrid gas electric. It must have blood. Must have blood. Ah, damn it. He then also teleports to Ashland and stabs him with a butter knife. Marshall gets his wife and kids so they can look for a way off the ship. First thing he finds is a freezer full of people. Ashland's not dead, of course. Marshall finds life jackets and lowers the anchor. Ashland's trying to snipe the family. Lousy camper. Marshall and the kids find a raft. The family gets away, which upsets Ashland. The ship isn't listening to him anymore, so he shoots it. The boat then fights back and eats him. Well, he did say it runs on blood. A helicopter flies over and sees the raft, so the family's saved. Fully refueled with blood, the death ship crashes into another cruise liner. The movie was filmed in Quebec, Canada, the Gulf of Mexico, and Alabama. This was part of the wave of Canadian-produced horror films from the 70s and 80s, which brought us such classics as The Brood, Funeral Home, Scanners, My Bloody Valentine, and Happy Birthday to Me. Director Alvin Rakoff made the action drama City on Fire under the Canadian Film Development Corporation, which was distributed through Astral Films. He followed that up with the adventure film King Solomon's Treasure, then returned to Canada for Death Ship and Dirty Tricks. The story was written by exploitation writer Jack Hill. Hill was a writer and director who made cult exploitation classics like The Big Bird Cage, The Swinging Cheerleaders, Switchblade Sisters, and Foxy Brown. While in film school, he worked on various student films with his classmate, Francis Ford Coppola. After film school, they both worked with Roger Corman on the 1963 film, The Terror. Coppola went on to direct Dementia 13, and roughly 10 years later made Hollywood history with The Godfather. He'll continue to work in B-movies up until 1982, where he wrote and directed the Corman-produced Sorceress under the pseudonym Brian Stewart. Years later, acclaimed director Quentin Tarantino named Hill as one of his influences. His film, Jackie Brown, was an adaptation of the Elmore Leonard novel, Rum Punch. In the book, the lead character's name was Jackie Burke, but Tarantino changed it to Jackie Brown as an homage to Hill. Both Foxy Brown and Jackie Brown starred Pam Greer. After the massive success of Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction, Tarantino worked with Miramax and set up the film distribution company, Rolling Thunder Pictures. The first film they released was a restored print of Switchblade Sisters on VHS. The movie was inspired by the 17th century myth of the Flying Dutchman. The Flying Dutchman was a ghost ship that was cursed to sail the oceans forever. If another ship came in contact with it, that ship was also doomed. The writers took the idea and updated it to a German World War II freighter, cursed to sail the Atlantic seeking new victims. Some of the footage from the film was lifted from the 1960 dramatic thriller The Last Voyage. They used the explosion, the piano falling, and the engine room flooding. The cover art for Death Ship was later redone poorly for the 2002 Dark Castle production Ghost Ship. Parts of the film seemed to jump around because for some reason, the scenes from the film were deleted. One such scene was Ashlyn talking to Marshall, explaining how he's now under the control of the ship. It's a devil ship, Ashlyn! And it's tainted with blood! As I am. Marshall then stabs him. In the theatrical cut, Marshall's in one room, and then suddenly appears in front of Ashlyn and stabs him. Not sure why they'd cut a scene like that, especially when you're getting George Kennedy giving a terrific performance. Death Ship is an unusual and shockingly dark film. At first it seems like it's going to be a movie about people on a haunted ship, but when it becomes apparent the ghosts are Nazis, it takes a very evil turn. Some folks complained about the film since the ghosts only speak to Ashland in German. However, given what's going on, you can pretty much surmise what they're saying. It was interesting to see Kennedy as the bad guy and Krenna as the hero. The two played off each other well, as would be expected, so it's a shame that scenes like this were cut. While some parts of the movie are silly, it does have its fair share of effective scares. The ominous presence of the boat, as well as Kenny's performance, keep the whole thing afloat. Plus, the clever production designers really did make the front of the boat look like a monster face. 
Death Ship is a scary, occasionally disturbing horror film. It's a shame this fell into obscurity, because with the bizarre story and the two great leads, it should be on way more horror fans' radars. What you doing now? I gotta go. You just beamed. 